good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all well. So uh, let me just introduce myself very quickly. I'm uh, Hui, one of the two co-founders of uh, CFT. Uh, previously, I used to be in banking. So uh, I used to run a group at Citibank, before that, ABS, uh, and before that, uh, Subgen. And before that, I used to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I used to be a tech entrepreneur in the US. Uh, Janos, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Charouz and Truman, for the introduction, and Hui. Uh, my name is Jan Claveris. I'm the head of entrepreneurship at CFT. Uh, before CFT, and it's something that we'll talk about later in the session, um, I was the founder of Supercharger, Asia's largest fintech accelerator, uh, where we had about 49 companies. So I've seen a lot of things on how startups have been able to grow. But most importantly, I think for today, uh, I built Supercharger because of the 2008 crisis. So I'll be sharing with you also some of the things I've seen and trends that are about to repeat themselves. Uh, so for today, we thought we wanted to discuss with you about the impact of uh, COVID-19 and the current uh, you know, crisis on uh, digital finance. Uh, and before that, you know, we thought that you know, before you know, jumping directly you know, into fintech, we wanted to talk about first you know, what's happening in the world you know, in general and the macro environment. So in terms of the way we're going to structure this, you know, Janos and myself will be talking for the next you know, 20 minutes or so. Uh, we'll have 10 minutes of Q&A and after that, you know, that will be networking. Uh, so first, you know, let's start, and you know, if you, know, you can help me, uh, let's start with the first slide where we wanted to talk about the macro environment. Because we'll talk about digital finance, we'll talk about fintech, but I think it's really important uh, that we talk about the macro environment. Uh, so in terms of the macro environment, that's another of my heart, but uh, I used to be head of macro structuring at ABS, typically you know, during the crisis of 2008. So looking at you know, what's happening in the world, before jumping into what's happening in fintech and to our companies, I think is important. So if we jump you know, to the first slide, um, and Janos, if you can help me on this, uh, if we can jump to the first slide of you know, what's happening to the economy. Uh, yeah, if you just give me one second, I'm about to share it. Uh, one sec. Okay, so we're almost there. Share screen, window. Okay, so now everyone should see a screen. If you want to see the, the screen in full for you, uh, simply click on the image and you'll be able to see it fully. Um, so I'm gonna present now. And we are here. There you go, Guy. you can see also the screen, right? Yeah, I can see the screen. That's very good. So this first slide, you know, it's perfect. So if you want to make it bigger on your screen, you know, just uh, hopefully you, know, you can all see them. Uh, and so what we wanted to show here is uh, uh, GDP. So that's the GDP of the US uh, for pretty much almost the last you know, 100 years. Uh, and you see that in terms of GDP in general, you know, it's positive. So economies you know, tend to grow. Uh, and uh, we had in 2009 a very big you know, crisis where we had GDP that became negative, uh, which you know, minus 2% uh, in the US in 2008, 2009. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, the very, very big recession of 1929, where we have a GDP which was negative of minus 10%. For this year, uh, and perhaps you know, I'll just ask so you can you know, participate in the chat. Now, quick question. Do you know what is the forecasted GDP for this year in the US? And perhaps you know, if you all type you know, in the general chat, we can see in terms of numbers, do you think it's going to be you know, whatever number? You know, just put a number on the chat and uh, we'll see if the chat works. What do you think the GDP in the US will be? Minus 10, Danny. So very, very big no crisis now for this year. Minus 15, two, minus 15. Minus two, minus five, minus one. Minus 10. Okay, very good. No, thanks a lot. Uh, so I think no, in general, all negative. So you all have the view that it's gonna be negative. Uh, which is good and you know with a lot of variability you know, around this Janos if you want to show the next slide sorry the uh, previous yep. one there you go okay so uh this is minus 10 
uh, in terms of you know, the forecast you know, for this year, I think that was the first answer, answer actually, it's minus 10. So minus 10% uh, in terms of GDP growth for this year, which is you know, the biggest crisis we've ever seen since the recession of 1929. In terms of the next slide, if we go to the next slide, here we'll talk about unemployment. Unemployment in the US, unemployment in the US you know, tends to be always you know, at the you know, best level around you know, three, four, five percent. And in big recessions, for example, like in 2009, 2010, we went to 10%. And uh, for you know, the crisis of the recession of 1929, we had 25%, which was you know, the biggest ever in terms of unemployment in the US. Perhaps the you know, same question to all of you. Uh, what do you think are the forecasts for unemployment in the US? 30%, so first answer, no, very, very high, so much higher, 35, 18, 20. Okay, 30. So actually, so you're all very good, actually, you know, in terms of numbers. So the numbers which are forecasted, not even, you know, by the end of this year, but in the next you know, few months, uh, will be unemployment, uh, you know, so if you can show this number of you no know, 35% in the US that's from the federal reserve of you no know, St. Louis. So that's the reason why we wanted to show this that we'll be talking about fintech and digital finance but I think that we're also in an environment which is totally unprecedented which is none of us has ever experienced this kind of environment before which means that in terms of the way we need to think you know we like to think you know at CIT we have a lot of different frameworks one of the innovation frameworks that we tend to think about is better, cheaper versus diff different, which is that better, cheaper means that you can do things you know, better than what you used to do before, you can automate, you can do, etc. It's much more about incremental or different, which is you know, thinking in a very, very disruptive way. Uh, we think that in the case of what's happening today, it's not really about better, cheaper, we're in a different world, so we need to think in a different way. So I think that was you know, the macro background that we wanted to start from, which is before jumping into fintech, it's you know, what's happening to the world, we will experience something that none of us have ever experienced before. So thinking in an incremental way is not necessarily the best way you know, to be thinking of. Uh, so I think you know, let's start uh, in terms of you know, first our learnings you know, from you know, Janos and myself, and perhaps you know, I'll ask you the question first, you know, Janos. In terms of what kind of learnings can we have in terms of your experience you know, from the previous recession? Know, what was the expense that you think you know, we can apply you know, to this you know, environment? You know, so, so I think for me, my, my profile uh, was a bit different, right? So I came out of university in 2010 um, when you had the financial crisis. And the financial crisis has been a bit slower to uh, convert into the real economy. So the, the, the bottom line of what happened to me was I couldn't get a job in banking as I just wanted to have a career plan after doing my undergrad and my bachelor. And so that led me to uh, build an accelerator, a supercharger, and first actually building a challenger bank in the UK. Um, so I think for me, the lack of job opportunity forced me to be an entrepreneur. Uh, if the economy would have been growing, I would think I would be in banking or in a law firm right now. But this hasn't been the case, and therefore I had to build uh, my job. And that's what came out of it. But I think the second part of this was, this was also the case for a lot of people that used to be in banking and left banking to build their own company. Um, so that's what I've seen was on the student side, um, not the job prospect that they expected to have when they came out of university and on the professional side, um, essentially simply a reduction of headcount, but those people had network expertise and still resources to bootstrap the beginning of a startup. So on my side, I think this is what I've seen, but um, do you think that there is any parallel between this and what you've seen, for example, in, in 2000? Um, thanks, Yano. So, 2000, so to give you some background, in 2000, I was CEO of UKB, which was a tech startup uh, in the US. Uh, and uh, just to tell you know, how we entered into the crisis, we were very well funded. Uh, so we had, I think, around you know, $10 million you know, in the bank you know, at the beginning of the crisis. And uh, as a startup, so I was quite young, that was you know, my first startup and my first professional experience in general. Uh, I had absolutely no clue of what happened. The reality is that I had no clue of what happened. In the sense that you know, day after day after day, we just had you know, bad news, bad news, bad news of, you know, uh, basically, you no know, companies, you no know, closing, you no know, people being unemployed, you no know, being fired, etc. 
And at the same time, because we had you know, started you know, to build a business you know, a few years you know, before, we were really in this mindset of, okay, so we need to do more. We need you know, to do better. Uh, we need you know, to talk more to our clients, etc. And we didn't realize that the world you know, had you know, totally changed. So we're really focused on our clients. But at the same time, you know, I think we totally missed you know, the big picture. So that's the reason why I wanted to talk about the big picture, uh, the big picture here. Uh, and I think what is interesting is that compared to my experience of 2008, uh, that was really different. Because in 2008, uh, so I wasn't an entrepreneur. I was uh, at RBS and uh, I was in charge of, of macro structuring. And here we were more of an observer and advisor because we were one of the, I guess, you know, only groups that has more or less you know, forecasted the crisis of 2008. So for us, it was really clear in terms of what was happening, in terms of you know, the severity of the crisis, you know, the impact on investment, the impact on you know, interest rates. Uh, and so here, in terms of the observer, it was quite interesting to see that you know, a lot of people didn't really understand what was happening. But as an outside observer and advisor, it was you know, much, you know, hard, uh, much, I guess, you know, easier to see. So I would say you know, my learnings from my experience as an entrepreneur is that it was you know, incredibly tough you know, at that at the same time, it was also incredibly tough because we had no clue of you know, what was happening. So something was happening, we didn't know what it was, and we we're just trying to work more, to work harder, to work faster, to try to basically you know, get our results, which we couldn't get. Uh, and at, on, on the other hand, you know, as a banker and you know, as someone who was more on the macro side, I think it was quite clear to see you know, what was happening and you know, some of the things you know, that could work and some of that, you know, that, that couldn't. Um, and perhaps, you know, uh, Janos, what do you think, you know, in terms of your experience, you know, what do you think if we talk about startups, you know, fintech startups, what will be the impact on fintech startups? Um, so there, there's different types of startups I think we need to talk about. Uh, the first one are existing companies um, that have a product, uh, they have employees, they have a team, and then we have the future startups that don't exist yet, and they're going to be built on the back of this new world. I think on the existing startups, um, let's divide fintech in two categories, B2C, B2B. B2B are software vendors providing financial institution a better piece of technology to serve either themselves or their end client. Sales cycles are long, they're going to get longer. And the bottom line for startups, it means uh, even more squeeze on cash flow. The majority of startups have, you know, anything from one to three months runway, unless they raised recently. Um, and I think founders are going to start feeling this. I think for those founders, change a little bit your sales pitch. Don't say anymore, you know, we're here to improve efficiency. No, you are here to increase the speed at which you can digitize a financial institution. Um, the world is not stopping, it's transforming faster. I think that's one for it. The second one is on people that want to launch companies. Um, an economic downturn is always difficult if you want to raise money, but I think the reality is that it takes time anyway to raise money. So if you have an idea now, think about building this idea. And once you have it, maybe in one year from now, when the crisis is going to be behind us, it will be exactly the perfect timing because you will have a product, you will have the beginning of attraction, and therefore you have a story to tell when you're going to be fundraising. So that's this. And finally, there is the bigger trend. I think um, all of you here have heard the term social distancing, uh, contactless. But if you think about this, this is a lot of what fintech companies have been doing, going from cash to electronic payment, going from going to a branch to open a bank account to giving opening a bank account by simply scanning your passport on the use of a mobile phone. So a lot of the, those fintech capabilities, which is about digital finance as opposed to physical finance, is rising. Um, if you take certain countries like in Asia, uh, in order to stimulate the economy, they are giving directly cash handout to their people. But how do they do this? By loading wallets that people have to directly spend in the economy. This is as opposed to the US where the government is writing you a check. So, in certain countries, governments are leveraging on that digital finance infrastructure to make sure that the money goes to people faster. And as a last example, think about what I was mentioning before. A lot of SMEs, not just startups, will have 
cash flow issues. They're very viable businesses. They have a good product. They have a good team. They're just going to be squeezed on the cash flow. What do they have maybe as an asset? Invoices. Invoice factoring. That capacity of unlocking your cash forward instead of you know, waiting for the payment. And if you have invoices with large financial institutions, you will be able to finance your invoices at a very good rate. So those are, I think, are some of the opportunities that we start seeing for sure on the startup side. Um, so it will be difficult for sure, uh, but you know we can expect about 10, 20% of the startups to do very well on this. And then for the people wanting to launch a company, do it now. I think the timing is is quite right. And you on, on the on, on the banking side, how do you think that banks are going to be impacted by this, both on technology but also on people? Yeah, so, so I think in terms of, of banking, um, so there's the macro environment that we discussed about and the industry environment uh, in general. Uh, I wrote uh, a blog about uh, what I call the tipping point is behind us, uh, where I was arguing that some financial institutions you know, were on their way to you know, very strong digitalization and were you know, accelerating, while some other ones you know, were really struggling and were starting to really fall behind. I think that in terms of you know, this whole you know, COVID situation, what's happening is that it is accelerating that process, which is that we are seeing uh, organizations which are continuing to transform themselves and actually which are accelerating. Uh, you know, for example, you know, this morning at seven o'clock in the morning, we had a call with a bank you know, in the Middle East, you know, which is you know, transforming itself and wants to go even faster in this environment. At the same time, you know, those that haven't you know, started their process yet or which are struggling on this, it's pretty much in the last chance and you know some of them you know, were really really fall behind uh, so there's no doubt that today we're in the digital uh, absolutely no questions about that that has accelerated you know a lot and for those which are already struggling on it uh, i think that's the last chance and for the rest you know, they will go you know, much much faster so uh, i think the crisis what is really doing is that it's just really exacerbating you know, the current you know, industry so we can't really talk about the financial industry in itself you know, as a whole anymore but it's really on a case by case no basis. Some of them will do amazingly well, and some of them you know, will really, really struggle, I think. And, and you know, Hugh, when you're talking about this, I think um, a digital economy is not just a financial services thing. And there was recently a, a funny meme, and uh, I'll share the slide now, which was, you know, who led the digital transformation of your company? And I think company is not just financial institutions. Um, and so, People said the CEO, the CTO, the big four, McKinsey, Agile Squad, or COVID-19. And I think everyone here, you can actually use the chat function and you can type what you think is supporting this. I'm going to give you then my answer on this, which is perhaps not as obvious as you may think. So if everyone is, can use the chat function and you can simply type uh, who you think is leading the digital transformation of your company right now, um, that would be quite good. And then in about 20 seconds, I'm, I'm going to give you my slide. What do you think, Fee? What, 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 what would be your, your answer on this? <laughs> That's hard because I've seen all of that on LinkedIn. All the answers are always you know, COVID-19. Okay. At the end of the day, uh, you know, COVID-19 you know, for me might be a catalyst. At the end of the day, that's always your senior leadership. But I don't know. I don't know what your answer would be. Okay. So um, I think I cannot see the chat on my side. So I'm guessing people are answering, but I'm going to go on the next one. Um, I think it's kind of what you were saying to you, which is the business is usually stopping, but speed of transformation is increasing. And it's exactly what you said. COVID-19 is a catalyst. I think a lot of the work that has been done by CEOs, agile called CTOs or big four consultancies, now they're even more relevant than they used to be yesterday. Um, and so I think all the organization that already had that strategy in place they kind of well placed because they simply have to go faster on what they've already been doing. So I think COVID-19 is not the only responsible for us being a more digital economy, um, but clearly it's been a catalyst that has moved forward this into the agenda of a lot of essentially organizations that have been doing this. So um, that's one thing that we see. And, and if you look at history, um, crisis has always created opportunities. Um, that's one that shows, you know, all the big firms, but also startups that emerge. And I think this slide is interesting because Microsoft actually was a very big beneficiary of the dot-com bubble. Big organization can come on top of this, just like small startups. So I think 
it's not a win winner takes all game for Silicon Valley startups to make the most of it. I actually think that large organization, whether financial or not, will be able to benefit from this, and they will doing some great things just like startups. So maybe I don't know how 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 you're seeing this here on on startup side. If if you were to have five million pounds today, what startup would you build on the back of this current uh, situation? That's a good question. So I think you know, if you were an entrepreneur today, uh, it's not a bad time at all to be an entrepreneur, uh, I would say. Uh, it's not a bad time. Why? Because you know, first, you know, in general, it's not a bad time to be an entrepreneur because uh, you know, the barrier to entry you know, has gone down a lot in terms of the tools that you can use, that you know, cloud is available, that you can use you know, uh, software as a service. So in terms of you know, the technology, it's much, much more accessible. At the same time, you know, all the huge competition that we saw over the last few years in terms of you no know, talents, in terms of resources, etc. So we're going to see less of that now. So which means that you can find you know, you know much, much you know, better talents and much cheaper than before. So I think being an entrepreneur is I think it's a good time you know, in general. Being an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur in general is always difficult, so that doesn't really change. The fact that you're in a crisis, I don't think that, that makes it you know, much, much more challenging. It will basically allow you to find your pain points, perhaps, you no know, much, much, you no know, uh, faster. Uh, where would I be? Uh, hard to say. You know, fintech, a huge, you no know, amount of, uh, I guess, you no know, opportunities, you no know, in fintech in general. Why? Because you no, know, all the things that you see in terms of, you no know, people, you know, who will need you know, to find you know, other solutions, you know, to find money, invest their money, you know, uh, uh, save their money for organizations, SMEs, you no, know, trying to find, I don't know, like subsidies, you no, know, from governments paying in a different way, looking at their accounting, because all of that needs to be digital. I think there's a lot of opportunities in the fintech space. Well, we are in London, of course, but pretty much you know, everywhere you know, around the world. Uh, perhaps you know, what I would say you know, in terms of you know, opportunities in general, I think you know, for individuals, time also for everyone just to take a step back and think. Again, we're not in a better world. You no, know, we're better. We're not, we don't have to think in terms of you know, how can I do what I do better but can i do something you no know, differently in terms of can i do my job you no know, differently or a different job uh, you know what are the opportunities because the risk of just thinking in an incremental way is too much of a risk in a world which is totally disrupted should we go on the, on the q a side because i think uh, that way people can ask questions yeah okay very good so i yeah, so we can see the Q&A, so that's, uh, that's really good. So, uh, I, and we can see upvotes also. Uh, so continue to upvote and, uh, and ask questions. Uh, perhaps first question, uh, Janos, what do you think will be the hottest job in fintech, banking, and finance? Ah, uh, is the, so, so thank you here for uh, <laughs> putting me on the bus on this one. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm going to put the, what I am. I think right now building a business is, is I think the hardest job is going to be your own job, uh, build something. Um, I'm coming from the background of having done a company during a crisis. And so right now I'm very comfortable with what's happening. Um, so the hardest job for me would be, you know, let's build an opportunity. Um, we've just done a course with a master's students in France and kind of what I was teaching them is maybe right now, because there's so much uncertainty, don't build a product, but build a company that captures the flow. Uh, build, you know, a comparison website uh, for your insurance policy, whether your insurance policy is now covering you for COVID-19. Um, build a remortgaging platform that is now allowing you to have a better rate if you were to refinance yourself. Um, so essentially, try to capture the flow as opposed to try to build a product, because we don't know the world in which we're going to go at the end of this. So I wouldn't yet build a product on a world that I haven't fully understood. Um, so I think for me, the hardest job would be my job, which is, you know, building things. Um, but I don't know if you may have a different opinion on this. Yeah, so I think hottest job, so, so that's always hard because there are millions of, of different jobs. Uh, I would say perhaps you no know, hottest skills, uh, which would be, to give you an idea, you know, when uh, we were in 2008, uh, so I was in a bank, no, I was at RBS. Uh, and in terms of our activities, it was you no know, record activities in 2008. 2009, 2010, we never had you no know, so much business because what did we do at that point? Uh, we had you know, anticipated the crisis and basically we were helping our clients, which were mainly other financial institutions or corporate clients, basically you know, to try to solve this. Uh, so we were basically in a, you know, try, you know, 
offering a solution to a big problem that people had, which is you know, really trying to get out of this crisis. I think you know, in today's situation, uh, in terms of what are the hottest, what is the most important skill, which you know, we've talked about you know, for years at TFT and, and even before, is I would say understanding of technology and digital. Uh, I think if there was you know, something that we've seen from this crisis that the world has become totally digital, you know, we do everything digitally now, just like, just like this, and the whole of finance is accelerating its shift you know, towards digital. So whatever you do in banking, what, it could be you know, credit risk, you know, research analyst, front office, middle office, um, you know, whatever it is, the understanding of technology is even more important because those organizations in the world try to transform themselves into becoming much, much more digital. So adding digital to what you do, I think you know, will be a, a very, very big asset. Same thing if, you, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, that you know, doesn't change you know, at, at all. The other thing uh, I would say is that in terms of opportunities, I don't know what will be the opportunities. What I know is that they will change very, very quickly. Just like you know, a, a month ago, we couldn't have forecasted what, what's happening today. So this ability to adapt and be very nimble, basically the skills and the mindset of an entrepreneur is really, really key. So being able to adapt yourself is really, really key. Should we, uh, should we take another five questions and we have to answer each of those questions in one sentence? So we're going to be challenging each other or one key word, okay? So I'll let you, I'll let you uh, throw me on the bus and you can ask me the next question and then I'll do it to you. Okay, perfect. You like challenges. Do you want to start with the first one or do I start with the first one? You, you can ask me the question. I'll try to answer it in one sentence. Okay, so trying to figure out what world we will have after this, where do you think the biggest impact will be? Is it on people, process, or technology? Um, so for me, it's going to be technology because we're really going to be testing it to its limit. Um, we're going to put a lot of strain on this, and we're going to really see what scales or not. So there you go. Okay, three, you're next. Uh, how will COVID situation affect the use of digital payments? Uh, well, that's, uh, that's easy. Uh, skyrocketing. Uh, it's not stopping. You know, the digital payments was already you know, on the way up. Now it's... Uh, uh, we saw this trend, so on your, uh, you know, on your screen, though, we saw this trend over the last few years, it's not stopping, it's going to go even faster. So not stopping. So what will be the biggest changes in consumer behavior and preferences during and post COVID? So I think there's going to be two changes. Uh, the first one is going to be um, uh, hygiene. So, uh, so, so hygiene is going to be, I don't want to touch something and therefore I'm testing new things. And therefore, I'm going to go online. But then the second trend is going to be now that I'm online and the virus situation is going to stop, my behavior has changed. And now I like the convenience. So I think people are going to move digital for hygiene and then people will stay digital for convenience. Um, OK, so COVID and crypto, what's going to be the impact? Uh, my answer would be not yet. OK, not yet. So uh, I, I don't think that COVID is having a huge impact on crypto at the moment in the sense of you no know, people you know, fleeing, for example, the dollars and going to Bitcoins and, and others. On the contrary, you know, in this kind of crisis, I think a lot of people will want to go back to things they're very familiar with, which might be the dollars, which might be gold or et cetera. Uh, at the same time, as you said, you know, the shift towards you know, much more digitalization and technology, uh, we're moving into a world where you know, central banks, you know, organizations are really trying to digitalized currency and you know that goes into you know cryptocurrency central bank digital currencies etc so uh, that uh, it's a profound trend but i don't think that covid you no know, really changes in the short term okay i let's make, yeah. take three more questions and then we'll go to networking so Sharuz will explain us how to do it okay so how do you think the consumer loans and sme loans will look like in 2021 and how much the credit history will count any longer um, so very, so I think the credit history is going to be a good metric because uh, financial institutions have been using old non-actual data of the position of a business to make a loan, uh, whereas now some fintech companies can almost have an hourly basis view of how well a business is doing. So you're really going to have credit score built on real-time data as opposed to on you know batch processes of three months old data. And this is what you'll see. You really will start seeing financial institution issuing loans with fresher, more real-time data, especially for SMEs, and I think for individual as well. Um, so that's my first one. 
Um, how to stay competitive in a COVID market? Um, I think the three main things, uh, skills, mindset, network. Uh, so skills, you know, whatever skills that you can get, you know, the more you can have, the better it is. And start with you know, technology and digital and understanding technology and digital. Uh, mindset, I think the really, really important, you know, this mindset of adaptability, looking for opportunities, you know, trying to see you know, what you can do and not stay idle. I think it's really important. And the last thing, which is you know, what we're doing today, is, is network. I think it's going to be very tough you know, in general for, for everyone. And you know, the more you know, you can find you know, people who can help, can support, you know, who can you know, sponsor, uh, I think you know, the, the easier it will be, especially in a world of you no know, social distancing. Okay. And uh, what time horizon are you looking for the current situation to resolve? Uh, I think, look, I, so I think in three months, the economy is going to get better. I think in 12 months, hopefully we're going to get a vaccine. But I think what's happening right now is something we'll remember our whole lives. So I think this will never resolve itself because everyone will remember March 2020. Um, it will be a day that will stay in people's minds. So I think psychologically, this will not resolve itself. People will remember that date. Economically, you know, we're going to start seeing better signs maybe in a quarter or two, but it's going to take time. We're not going to go the way we went down. We're not going to go up. So um, that's my view. But th that date in 2020 will stay in people's mind. It's a it's a transforming moment. So that's not going to resolve itself. I don't know. Maybe if you have a difference, and then we can go to networking, but. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, so, you know, we, we talked about it before, uh, and I like to look at history, you know, macro, etc. We've never seen this kind of environment, you know, before, even going back to the uh, recession of 1929. So that's really, really hard. You know, if you ask me, you know, two months ago, I would have never been able to anticipate and predict this. So, so we've never seen this before. However, my experience, you know, from the previous crisis is that they tend to be longer and sometimes you no know, much longer than what we anticipate. Uh, so with the severity of this current crisis, it's quite possible that it's going to be much longer than we anticipate, which is not a question of month or, you know, but really a question of years. Reality is that we don't know, so I'm not going to try to make an assumption on this. Just, you know, I guess, you know, in terms of the mindset, you know, for example, at CFT, this is what we're starting to think of, is that we are really in a different world that will stay for much longer than what we think. All right, Hugh, thanks a lot for the chat. Really appreciate it. And stay, 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 stay safe at home. You too. Ciao.